Hi there, I'm Kerry Buchanan, author of the Harvey and Birch crime thriller series set in Northern Ireland. My first book, Knife Edge, was accepted for publication and then released during the lockdown, so as you can imagine it's been a pretty surreal experience over the last year. On top of that, I've been shielding, so cabin fever has crept in from time to time. However, I have allowed some of my characters to escape, perhaps as surrogates for me, but only after I've put them through a bit of, a he a bit of hell first. My own dream escape for after lockdown is something I've been nurturing for many, many years. My husband and I would plan to take our own boat from her home port in Northern Ireland and sail her down to the north coast of France. And when we get there, we're going to drop the mast, turn her into a river boat and send, set off on a slow meander through the French canals. Assuming we don't take a wrong turn and end up in Holland, we plan to pop out in the Mediterranean and then from there mast back up and the big adventure begins, coast and island hopping all the way to Turkey. But sadly I'm not there yet, so today with the sound of rain hammering against the windows, instead I'm going to read you an excerpt from Knife Edge, the first in the crime series. And in this my main character Nick has just escaped from a serial attacker and is on the run. Keep on moving, keep on moving. Nick repeated it over and over in her head like a mantra. She fell heavily, bruising shoulder and hip, but somehow managed to get back up again, and then again, and again. The clouds thinned. Starlight revealed a metal footgate, held closed by a loop of string. She used her lips to nudge the string over the top of the post, working around the cloth gag that stretched the corners of her mouth wide and made her want to retch. At last the gate swung open on rusty hinges, squealing into the night. She caught her breath and froze, listening, but there was no shout of discovery, no crashing pursuit. Not yet. Another bank lay beyond the gate. Once again she tumbled down it, snapping last year's dead dock stems as she fell. This time she could barely stand, but ahead of her was open space with sky above, coaxing her forward. A sliver of moon turned the world to shades of grey. Enough life, light to make her way through dew-soaked grass towards a gap that stood pale in a dark hedge. She stumbled, stubbing her toes on boulders that jutted up from the ground in the gateway, but pushed onward, repeating the chant. One of the shadows moved, and a twig snapped. Hot urine bathed the abused flesh of her inner thighs, the final shame. And then warm breath bathed her face, smelling of sweet, crushed grass. Oh, horse! She closed her eyes for a moment, overwhelmed by relief. A second horse moved out of the shadows, short and fat. It gave a gusty sigh and walked off through a gap in the hedge. With nothing else to guide her, Nick followed it. At the top of a long slope, it stopped and she walked into its furry bottom. Lucky you don't kick, she thought. Then the pony dropped its head down and splashed noisily. Nick groped her way past the animal and dropped to her knees as it moved away. A large plastic bucket was tucked near under the hedge. She'd never have found it if it hadn't been for the pony. So Nick shoved her face into it, letting water soak into the rotten cloth that gagged her and then sucking until she had enough to swallow. The water was slimy with bits of vegetation floating in it, but still the most delicious drink she'd ever tasted. Revived in body and spirit, she got back to her feet and trudged on, leaving the horses behind. Where there was a water bucket, there had to be people, surely. Lights flashed, but she couldn't decide if they were real or imaginary. Her mother's voice called her name, almost close enough to touch, but when Nick turned, there was no one there, not even the lights. She was alone. The horses had even disappeared. Nick stumbled onwards until she splashed through thick, gloopy mud and half fell into another gate, its cold metal against her naked skin. The iron bolt that held the gate closed was almost her undoing. The weight of the gate made it impossible to shift with teeth or chin or even elbow. She needed two hands, one to lift the gate and one to draw the bolt, but her hands were still bound behind her back. In the end, she turned around and managed to work the bolt free with her numb fingers, grunting with the effort. Nick, her father's voice called. I'm coming, Daddy. Wait for me, she sobbed as she dragged herself through the gap following the phantom voices. Keep on moving. 
She was on a farm track with a raised middle strip where grass grew. Another light hovered high in the trees, but this one didn't fade when she looked at it. A security light on the wall above a white farm gate. Beyond the gate was a yard and a house with cars parked outside. There'd be people there sleeping at this hour. She pushed at the gate, wasting too much time and energy before she noticed the padlock. Shit. The sky was lightening, paling towards dawn, and here she was out in the open, no better off than when she'd run. She daren't shout to try and raise the people in the house. Who knew how far away her captor was? A car approached. Headlights licked, lit up a tarmac road not 20 yards away as the vehicle flashed past. She ran the distance, hobbling over the gravel at the side of the road and stood in the middle of the lane, watching red taillights disappear into the distance. Which way should she go, left or right? She spun, seeking a clue. Was the sky brighter to the left? It had an orange glow, not just sunrise. There must be street lights that way in civilization. She set off in a stumbling run, squandering the last of her strength. Her feet were numb on the loose gravel. In fact, they barely felt anything at all by now. Another engine roared in the distance, passing by at speed. A main road? She panted, each breath louder in her ears than the one before. So close, so close to help. Just keep going, keep on moving. It was a wide road with a pale, hard shoulder. She lurched out into the middle where hatched white lines marked the centre. Not a car to be seen in either direction. A faint smell of oil assaulted her nostrils, tantalising and ephemeral, but there was no traffic now. Nick collapsed, thumping down onto the hard tarmac and gave herself up to despair. She had no idea how long she lay there, the road surface cold and rough against her cheek, before something big passed her in a buffet of wind and noise, peppering her with dirt. She couldn't find it in herself to care whether it stopped or ran her down. Air brakes hissed and a door slammed. Boots slapped on the wet surface as someone ran towards her. Are you all right, love? A man with a Geordie accent asked. Here now, let me see your pet. Oh, fucking hell. Arms came around her, warm against her chilled skin, and she was lifted bodily, head lolling. She tried to speak but couldn't tell if she'd made any sound. The rumble of a big diesel engine drowned out everything, all sound, all thought. A blur of flashing lights and voices followed, pestering, coaxing, soothing. Finally, someone cut the cable ties and her wrists fell apart. A scream ripped out of her as her shoulders moved, pain flaring through spine and arms. More voices, a tinfoil blanket that stuck to her raw wounds. Faces loomed and receded, white blobs with gashes for mouths that bled questions she couldn't answer. Then she was in an ambulance, rocking from side to side as white light dazzled her. A siren wailed. Someone was stabbing her again, a needle in her arm. She fought, fists flying, and tried to push herself free, but firm hands held her. Liquid ice flooded her veins. She fell back, limp against stiff white pillowcases that rustled and was at peace. Thank you for listening.